Welcome, Laurie Anderson. Welcome, Alexander Kozaya, in this conversation uh, as part of the Holland Festival about one of our associate artists for this year, Ryuichi Sakamoto. Um, both of you are linked to Sakamoto and also to the Holland Festival, of course. Uh, Laurie Anderson has been there quite uh, a lot of times in the past. And Alexander, you're actually making your debut this year with a, a production that is related also to Sakamoto. We will come back uh, to that later. Um, I would like to start maybe with a very open first question. Um, I'm curious for both of you how you first encountered uh, Ryuichi Sakamoto, both um, his music and and also himself as a, as a person. Laurie, maybe you can start? Um, I was trying to think of, of that exact time, and I don't think there was one, probably um, because the, the blur of the early 80s, which is when I met him, <laughs> was uh, uh, pretty extreme. I, and I, I'm thinking I could have met him at a music festival somewhere, uh, very likely. And we, you know, brushed uh, by each other many times, and then... Uh, but at that time, we we didn't really get much of a chance to do more than just appreciate each other's work. <laughs> we never got to, to work together. Uh, I would have um, really loved that. I guess I, I um, when I picture Ryuichi from that time, I see him really from a distance and uh, at a uh, on a... Uh, on a stage with a lot of light, and then, uh, uh, then our, our friendship changed uh, over time. But um, I was very aware of his film music because I, I was very fascinated with that. In in the um, at that time, I I uh, thought it was very daring of him to um, make film scores because it didn't seem somehow. Uh, serious to us in New York. We were like, oh, film scores, no. But they were so beautiful that everybody kind of went, oh, film scores, nice. Um, so uh, it was uh, a little bit through, through a media haze that I saw him then. But you, you, you mentioned the word appreciation. Where did the, the kind of the mutual appreciation come from? In that time, what was it that you recognized I in each think other? We or? both liked things, that, even though we both did things that were a larger scale. Uh, I think that we related to each other on a level of very, very quiet things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that the things that I loved the most of his at, at the time were very quiet piano pieces <laughs> that just almost just drifted through the air, uh, almost weren't there. And I was like, that is a vanishing way to make music how beautiful and and the length of time between the notes i learned so much from that mm. you know and i began to write things that were tried to you know i was trying to dissolve as well and make things very uh uh very small mm -hmm. with lots of the kind of i suppose pauses that would be in conversation you know, that you never really know where that next note was going to come in through the window. <laughs> it just, you would be, oh, oh. So I found that in his work. It's uh, also a thing that uh, reminds me of, of John Cage in a way, like maybe you're both in that respect children of Cage, or is it? <laughs> I think everyone's a child of Cage somehow, <laughs> you know. he, he uh, I, w When you look at his inclusiveness in particular, and his and his willingness to see all sound as music mm -hmm. uh, that that never ceases to be incredibly daring. But in terms of solitude, one of the, his images that I like very much, uh, he wrote about painting, but I think it also applies to to music in in many ways. He said, you know, that when you begin a piece, or when we begin a painting, everybody's there. Mm -hmm. Every painter in the world and all your friends and all your critics and your family and everybody, blah, 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 everyone's there. And they keep painting and pretty soon they drift off and they, 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 there's aren't, there are no crowds or small groups and then they, they drift off and then and finally it's only you and then finally you leave. <laughs> and this is my experience of painting as well and also 
uh, music of that kind, uh, it almost seems like it it populates as it as it develops instead of becomes uh, more and more uh, about solitude. What do you think, Alex? Well, actually, it, it's it's funny that you mentioned the the piano pieces because the first memories I have of Sakamoto in my life because I haven't met him personally, but I do are like these memories of these these piano pieces that I heard as a really small child, like uh, oh. uh, on CD. And it's it just kind of, they always stuck in my memory since then. Yeah. It's just like this, extre- it's like this extremely positive feeling. You know, there's the simplicity of the harmonies, just the melodies, yeah. the sound of the piano, everything. I just remember it the first time hearing it and the moment that weather that was when we were there and the flat we were in <laughs> and all these kinds of things. And yeah, that is. I mean, yeah, that is kind of my first memory of him. Yeah, I just, I just had this image of him plucking the piano string of the piano that survived mm-hmm. uh, the tsunami, and and the and him listening to that sound uh, and just a single note of mm-hmm. struck it. It's, it is, it is that for me too. Just. But what you said also about this rep- repopulating thing, it also has, I mean, some of the, you know, the, the melodic music and the film music, it also has that in a way, you know, it really like fills you up in a way. Yeah. Um, it's like yeah. it has, it has both almost. It's strange, yeah. It has both, but I think in the film scores, they they really are very uh, landscape ish. Don't you think? I mean, I, I just um, are you then referring yeah. specifically to the score of the Revenant that, with the landscape ishness, or that? I, I guess, um, but I uh, uh, or maybe it's just because these are film scores, and I know that they're they're uh, related to imagery and so i see imagery maybe it's just as simple as that i know that a lot of sakamoto's music i you know i got to know in some form and then later i found that was actually a score or that was actually an electronic piece from an album from you know 78 or that was actually you know like uh i think his his musical material like has appeared in so many different forms yeah uh yeah, with with David Sylvie, and it was very different from from the film, and, and suddenly, you know, it, it um, and I would say very different. I mean, they didn't really remind me of each other. Uh, did, you, did you? How did you feel about when they showed up in uh, different shapes like that? Did they seem like a family sound, or or quite different? I think it's just. The moment, the first version that you hear, that's sort of the one that, oh, yeah. you know, you become, yeah. most, I guess, from familiar with. There's this famous theme, of course, from the from the Last Emperor movie. And first hearing it, I didn't know that was film music. And then much later, like five, six years later, when I, when I saw it in the movie, I was like, ah, so that's how it is. But in my brain, that was already something completely else. So.
And Lori, you said that in the beginning you saw Ryuichi more from f at a distance in a way. So at what point did you get closer? And um, how, I mean, how did that happen? Um, probably somewhat through Ardo Lindsay, mm. actually. And, um, and little uh, circles of people that in begin to intersect. I think he convinced me to do a Fenez thing. So that was like why I uh, was, he said, remixes are really, uh, you should try it. And I was like, oh, I'm not sure I care, care about that. I mean, uh, it's like, they, they can do it if they want. I don't really care. And he said, well, you might learn something from that. I was like, probably good. <laughs> Again, so, it's about the withdrawing uh, of yourself from your work, basically. Exactly. It is. It is. And um, his generosity uh, in terms of that was really striking to me because, I mean, I'm not somebody who, when the paint dries, don't ever touch it. I, I, I'm, I see things as really in process. And, and I mean, right now I'm, I'm doing a lot of, of painting. And so I, I uh, don't ever, uh, I have a, um, even more reluctance to finish a painting than I do with a piece of music. You know, if I, I would like to, if it goes into a museum, I'd, I'd like the opportunity, the right to come in and work on it every night if I felt like it, you know, it would just keep it going. Um, it's, and a person in music, you can always do that because you play an old piece and if you do play an old PC, you play it in a completely different way and think about it differently, and and it never um, never solidifies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in fact, it's very very helpful to give up my sense of uh, my my own seeing my own style, mm -hmm. my own sense of self, and and to realize that that everything is shattering every second. You know, there's there's no possibility of holding on to anything, so, nothing. So, so talking about things that never finish, uh, your most recent collaboration with Ryuichi is part of his series called Incomplete, um, <laughs> yeah. which of course yeah. already, Perfect. well, the name is already <laughs> a sign of what it what it's supposed to <laughs> never do, to, to complete. Um, and, and, and your uh, um, contribution to that is a piece called um, Low Tide. Um, or was it High Tide? Maybe I'm... I think it's low tide, high tide. It's low both, tide. That's the, that's the text. Yes. <laughs> can can you tell low a bit about uh, how that collaboration took uh, took place? Oh well, let's see. It was maybe a couple of years ago when uh, I was having um, maybe lunch with Ruichi, and we had such a great time having lunch that we said, "Let's just do this next week." And then we just kept doing it for like a year. And um, and then through the pandemic, we met online and he, he came in as often as he could. And uh, so, so with the rest of us, but it, we became, we had a, a kind of a breakfast club. Only the two of you or were there others? Oh, no, I'm sorry. There, there were originally three of us. Mm -hmm. um, Ian Newton, who is a mutual friend, and so we just had a very good time about talking, not always at all about music, but uh, um, this was during the uh, Trump time. So we had a lot of, of things to uh, uh, be horrified about mm -hmm. and, um, and mutually um, uh, supportive about. And, um, and then uh, Ardo Lindsay uh, came yeah from Brazil and Ryuichi gave both Ardo and me um, some beautiful uh, shapes that uh, were quite uh, grainy and, uh, and volume, lots of volume. And I really appreciated those because inside of those I could do some things with language that I've been thinking about doing. And I find it uh, very easy to uh, write words um, in a situation like that. I, I did maybe um, 10, let's say, violin ideas, and then just said, put them anywhere. And um, 
that was really fun because that, that was a surprise. He used only one, mm-hmm. but he used it like here and there and under and backwards and, you know, winding around. And so it became uh, thematic. And it was really just a, a kind of like, you know, one of the ideas. So I was really fascinated how he um, used that particular phrase, you know, in, in ways that were, were uh, changed throughout his, his piece. So it, it was really like um, Ardo and I were, were, it wasn't so much a collaboration as we were just giving him raw material to, to work with. And, and so it was uh, really an interesting thing to hear what he had done with that. High tide, and then another low tide. The waves that rise and fall. Perhaps this was in another language. Did it have anything to do with, let's say, hand signals? High tide, low tide. On this same island, half creature thought, Am I in debt or is it doubt? My eyes show up, sunrise, sunset. Why is everyone running? Hi, faces. Wind, where air was empty. At the horizon, on the bridge, barely a hint, a little bit of a strut. Or at least the words that were flowing through my brain so fast that they never made it into speech, not even into words. They were just thoughts, just electrical firing. problem with this system, or one of the problems with it, is that it doesn't leave much room for you to be thinking other things while listening. Would you say that is a typical, that the result is a typical work for Ryuichi? Is it, I mean, what, how would you describe, you know, it's the, the Sakamoto quality of it in a way? Yes, it is. It's pure it's pure Ryuichi music, you know, with just some accents from other people. I, 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 uh, and, and I'm just saying that because of the overall feeling of it and the overall mood of it. It's, um, it immediately becomes him. Yeah, but how would you describe true. this overall feeling? This how would I describe the feeling? Um, uh, I, uh, um, Wind would be one uh, image that would come to mind, um, mm-hmm. and uh, 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 I, I mean, I, I just have to resort to water, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I can see why a tsunami was really um, uh, marked him because his he he uses those in his mm-hmm. in his music. Suddenly, there is a a wall 300 feet of water yeah. and um, and you didn't see it coming. <laughs> so, so I would say weather uh, would be one way to think of it and shifting. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I know those are quite, quite vague, but uh, I guess those would be ways I would try to. Yeah, no, it makes, uh, makes perfect sense, I would bit. say. I wanted to ask Alex, because you're in a way also, well, collaborating is maybe a big word, but you're basically collaborating across time with Ryuichi, because it, this time it's not like uh, Laurie offering material to Ryuichi, but it's the other way around, because you're taking his old material, music from the early 80s, and, and turning it into basically a new composition with your own name under it. Can you, can yeah. you uh, with his permission, I should add, um, can you can you tell a bit more about why and and what you're doing? I just, I mean, what what I thought about in the beginning was that there is this his music that just uh, that you know I you I always I always 
in any time of the last couple of you know 10 years i always sat at a piano and played something by him and it was always like just uh, and always listen to it with my friends. And whenever I got new friends or went to a new music academy or met new people, I would always show the tracks by Sakuma. What do you think about that? And so that was just the first idea that I had when you told me about this project and to do something with Sakamoto's music is was taking these tracks that are stuck with me forever and doing that how I hear these, doing, yeah, how I hear them basically, or actually try to make, to, turn the music into that how i remember hearing it for the first time but you're basically recreating your memory of the music instead of remixing well yeah that, i mean that's very history. much that's very much like uh you, it sounds very sort of nice but of course that's not really uh that's not really uh possible i think i'm more like when my when one thing of it was for me that i don't I don't look at any scores or try to listen to it too much or anything to the pieces. I really just try to get it out of my memories. And so sometimes the parts are really off or different. But then that, that means, I mean, you could say that between your memory of the piece and the actual score of the original, there would be some correspondence, which then should be, at least for you, the essence of the pieces or the, 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 you know, the soul of the pieces. Is that something... Well, there's, I have in each piece a soul that I found, I think, for myself, mm -hmm. not now, but over the past, over a long period of time. And I try to sort of really find out what that actually is and, and write that down, what actually, what I hear mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, and I really try that and it's really, I guess, yeah. It's, Sometimes it's very easy, sometimes it's very hard. But I, now I was curious also to hear, because in, I think in the process you'll be uh, um, probably thinking a lot about what exactly, you know, the, maybe the same question I asked Lori, like what is the, the, the Sakamoto-ness of, of the music? What turns a, you know, a piece into, into something that is vintage, uh, which is Sakamoto, which I could imagine that you discover that in the process, because if you take away too much, it won't you know, be um recognizable anymore and the, on, the, on the other hand you're not going to just clone the pieces so um i mean you might not have the answer yet but i think in the process that you could discover this yeah kind of uh, i think there's for me it's, it's strange it's really strange i have to tell you because i noticed through working on that how much sakamoto is actually in my pu in my music anyway uh it's it's, it's, not, it's not even funny like um <laughs> no that's funny <laughs> that is funny <laughs> i mean certain things i just when i started actually you know like transcribing and listening to it like, man that sounds exactly like what i would have it would, what <laughs> uh so i think that really sort of yeah i don't even have i there's never a danger that I think this part is going to be lost in the music. It was more, um, it was more like a discovery for me. That's just like how much of like the language I started just subconsciously using for myself, thinking it's me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's everywhere. That's fantastic. That, that that just says so much about how. Uh, music moves through people's uh, lives and minds, you know, it, it, you, and you don't have to go, oh, that's me, that's mine, that's yeah. my mark there, and that's your mark there. It it, it resists that so well, you know. Yeah, well, and, and also the process, as you, as you described, Laurie, the process with uh, uh, with uh, high tide, low tide, um, sounds also like that. Like, in the end, you can't really untangle you know, who who uh, brought in what? Because your contribution will be morphed. Everything is you know, kind of blended together into something, um, a new reality in a way. Yeah, and I think that that new reality it doesn't have a name stamped on it. And we, although for me it is is it has Sakamoto stamped mm -hmm. on it because it that's the that's the tie that uh, and the current that pulled us in, you mm -hmm. know, and, and made it part of that world. It, it was irresistible. Yeah. Um, and I think if, for example, Arto had begun a piece and pulled Ryuichi and me into it, 
uh, it would have the nature of Ardo. So I'm very curious about your piece of music, whether that will be Ryuichi's stream coming into your overarching idea. And um, again, not that it so much matters, but it, it it's it's just kind of interesting uh, to just to, to think about um, what's the dominant um, uh, engine in each person's work, or what do they really feel should be um, what makes it. Uh, beautiful for them, you know, and it's slightly different from from person to person, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, and also, of course, I mean, I never, you know, if you would hear it, probably you would hear much better, actually, because I don't know him, so I don't know how, of course, he hears his music. So, so for me, it's yeah, I just, I almost like I, I sort of not think about that part too much in a way. Right. But yeah. But but I had. But I had a, a very sort of what what you said, uh, Jochen, before about you know, uh, sort of when is it Sakamoto? When is it not Sakamoto? I had this this moment where I you know I one of his electronic pieces I sort of transcribed and put it into the string quartet and everything and and uh, and something about it just it didn't feel like there was no, it just didn't feel like Sakamoto in a way, and then I started playing it in a different key and all of a sudden it did. And that was that was like such a that was such a moment because it was a different key than the original piece was in, uh, but all of a sudden for me, like just like you know like a, whatever fifth or something lower, it just felt more like all of a sudden it was Sakamoto again, sort of, <laughs> which was strange. that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. I wonder why that happened. It's, yeah. it's probably the mystery of music that we won't we won't be able to uh, <laughs> to kind of put our finger on right now. But, uh, there is some. Something something happened apparently when you transpose the music to a different key. I mean, which basically doesn't change anything in the proportions, but still gives it an entirely well, it changed, different. It flavor. changes, of course, the color of yeah. the just where it is and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And it just, or, yeah, or maybe just start hearing it in a new way, like you said. But it's I mean fascinating. Also, this question about what what is what is typical, what's typically Sakamoto. It's also related, of course, to the mystery of him being able to operate in such totally different musical environments, like writing film scores, making you know, pop music, doing the opening ceremony for Olympics, uh, you know, very experimental electronic stuff. And it's all somehow unified in this single person. I mean, I don't know so many musicians who've been active in such a broad range of musical genres, or maybe the other way around, to whom musical genre doesn't exist at all as a concept. <laughs> That's a good way to put it, yeah. I think that's the best way to put it. The genre doesn't exist, and he's he's just moving through those with his with his voice, and 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 then changing each one of them, mm -hmm. pulling them more towards his sort of mystic center, you know, because uh, it is a mystical center mm -hmm. of of. I mean, that's how, how I experience it. That there's something very big and over and 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 weather like that's that's. Uh, um, sheltering all of those those things that that has a beautiful emptiness to it mm -hmm. that uh, I I really respond to and so it can can encompass almost any form because it's so it's so big you know and even when it's really small it's so it's so big because uh, it has emptiness at the center and uh, that is uh, uh, and and uh, and the lack of the uh, creator <laughs> that has it's, that person has been the person who's saying this is my style has been pulled away. So it, it, that's a, a very radical thing to have done. Yeah, I mean, and you feel that in this in all this music. I mean, for the for me, it, 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 Cage as well. Anyone who has these big overarching sort of ways of seeing the world is able to somehow put it into into a vocabulary of music or images, or and with with Cage's chance things too. Uh, you hear that in his in his music, and 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 uh, Ryuichi doesn't. I, I don't think has been so formal in saying what it is, you know, I mean, if Cage left us with lots of <laughs> aphorisms and things. Um, and, 
but Ryuichi leaves us with, with he, he comes up with all these little fables almost, little stories of, uh, and all so connected to the world we live in of tsunamis and, and nuclear power. And he's an artist who is seeing those things and really engaged in, in those, particularly in the more troubled um, things have of, of uh, the world. And, and weirdly, they have a, um, a weather-like, <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, a weather-like quality, you know, um, of tsunamis and nuclear power and a poisoned atmosphere. And, you know, that, that, he, that it's, he's almost like a cloud artist but, somehow. And these fables, I mean, can you, do you remember, can you cite an example or? Oh, that's, uh, then the thing of plucking a piano, for me, I'm counting as a fable. Ah, okay. There's ah, a piano that's... that survived this, and you're and that's a that's like a a, a relic from another time, and a, and it's a it's a really weird fairy tale that involves a lot yeah. of people who suffered and and a huge event, and so so the, it's that sense of of um, precious object in a in a. Catastrophic. <laughs> I see, like like a singularity, a singularity that contains a lot of yeah references, connections, history, yeah. story. Yeah, uh, yeah. very dense. Yeah, object. actually, mm -hmm. I, I another funny discovery I made was one of my favorite pieces from him. Uh, the first version of it has this big intro that was just that as a child I always thought, well, that's his vocoder intro for like of a, of a poem, I guess, and I didn't I didn't know what it means, so it was just like. No. Uh, skipped it, and, and now I looked <laughs> up the, <laughs> and now I looked up the translation, and actually it's a it's a poem, uh, it's a poem from Mao, the Chinese uh, dictator, mm -hmm. and from his like uh, victory uh, uh, sort of is his battle oh. victory poem, oh. and then the piece starts, which is super happy and sort of very nice, and I thought. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, you know, I was thinking, what did he mean with that? Gives it quite a different <laughs> charge, hilarious. I would say. Yeah. But what's yeah. It, what, which, which piece is that, Alex? What's a the Thousand Knives, which, you know, the title says yeah. something. Like, yeah. Which then reminds me of the story which forms the basis of, of Ryuichi's new music theater piece, which will be uh, premiering during the festival, Time. Mm. Um, that's the title, um, which is about time and which is based on a, also a kind of a, a fable about this person who is um, waiting at somebody's grave and doesn't notice that 100 years of time have passed in the meantime. So it's about forgetting time. It's about... Um, as Ryuichi says, the, the the idea of time is that he's of the of the piece is that he's trying to make a non-linear work which doesn't follow the like the everyday concept of time as something that progresses, which he kind of wants to to avoid in this piece. Is that something that um, I mean, yeah? Does that does that sound like a typical thing for him to you, Laurie? Or I, I can 
I can I can't wait for it. I mean, I I, I don't know what he, where he's going to go with that, but uh, it's I love the ambition of it. Some calling something life, and then the fellow was talking. <laughs> so uh, uh, amazing, um, but I I think the intricacy of that would be uh, seeing how he's going to pull imagery into it because he will he'll, he'll mm-hmm. have this guy uh, in this magnificent um, huge setting of an idea will have I'm sure um, um, and I don't know, I hate the word vignette but something of small stories within it that will um, in an in oblique ways uh, talk to each other about the nature of time so uh, I'm sure it's it, I, I can't wait to see that. I mean, that, that's mm-hmm. um, the ambition of that is I, I admire very much. Thanks to okay. the two of you, Laurie Anderson, Alexander Kordzaya. It was wonderful talking to both of you about Ryuichi Sakamoto. And yeah. um, uh, hopefully, uh, well, we'll see Alex uh, soon in the upcoming festival edition. And hopefully, Laurie, you will uh, have another chance to, to be at the festival as well soon. Thanks for your time. Thanks for asking us. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was nice to meet you, Laurie. <laughs> same, same. I'm looking forward to hearing your piece. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. You too.